We begin our worship this morning with the singing of the hymn When Morning Gilds the Sky, to be found in Christian worship number 251. Christian worship and turn to page 38 in the front of the hymnal to follow the responsive opening liturgy, the service of the word that's found there. Please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus my Savior, I pray. Have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord using the insert, I want to walk as a child of the light.
Savior, and for the privilege of being called a member of your body. Forgive us when we forget the privilege you have given us. Give to each of us a strong faith in you, and grant us the grace to show in all our actions the love you had for us in making us your child. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our head. Amen. You may be seated. The scripture lessons for this morning are printed in your worship folding. You might also follow along in your own Bible or one that is in the pew in front of you. The Old Testament lesson from Exodus chapter 18, an interesting piece of Moses' life as a leader of the people of Israel, interacting with his father-in-law who gave him a wise piece of advice. Moses was inundated with the job of making decisions and judgments on behalf of the people. And as the people of Israel grew, so did his workload. And as Jethro saw that the work was beyond the capacity of Moses to carry out by himself efficiently, Jethro said, find some able individuals to carry out the judgments on a smaller scale using their gifts so that you only handle the tough cases. It's an opportunity for us to see the importance of utilizing the different members of Christ's body, whatever era, to carry out his work together. Exodus chapter 18. Jethro, the priest of Midian and father-in-law of Moses, heard of everything God had done for Moses and for his people Israel, and how the Lord had brought Israel up, had brought Israel out of Egypt. After Moses had sent away his wife Zipporah, his father-in-law Jethro received her and her two sons. One son was named Gershom, for Moses said, I have become an alien in a foreign land. And the other was named Eliezer, for he said, My father's God was my helper. He saved me from the sword of Pharaoh. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, together with Moses' son and wife, came to him in the desert, where he was camped near the mountain of God. Jethro had sent word to him, I, your father-in-law Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and her two sons. So Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and bowed down and kissed him. They greeted each other and then went into the tent. Moses told his father-in-law about everything the Lord had done to Pharaoh and the Egyptians for Israel's sake and about all the hardships they had met along the way and how the Lord had saved them. Jethro was delighted to hear about all the good things the Lord had done for Israel in rescuing them from the hand of the Egyptians. He said, Praise be to the Lord who rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians and of Pharaoh and who rescued the people from the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all other gods, for he did this to those who had treated Israel arrogantly. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and other sacrifices to God, and Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law in the presence of God. The next day Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people, and they stood around him from morning till evening. When his father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he said, what is this you are doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as judge while all these people stand around you from morning till evening? Moses answered him, Because the people come to me to seek God's will. Whenever they have a dispute, it is brought to me, and I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and laws. Moses' father-in-law replied, What you are doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Listen now to me, and I will give you some advice, and may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. Teach them the decrees and laws, and show them the way to live and the duties they are to perform. But select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Have them serve as judges for the people at all times, but have them bring every difficult case to you. The simple cases they can decide themselves. That will make your load lighter, because they will share it with you. If you do this and God so commands, you will be able to stand the strain, and all these people will go home satisfied. Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. He chose capable men from all Israel and made them leaders of the people, officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. They served as judges for the people at all times. The difficult cases they brought to Moses, but the simple ones they decided themselves. Then Moses sent his father-in-law on his way, and Jethro returned to his own country. This is the word of the Lord. We'll join in singing Psalms 133 and 34 printed for you. The melodies are found in Christian worship on page 115.
the end of Christ's earthly ministry with his disciples in the upper room, Christ, the head of his church, gives an example of service as he serves his disciples. The first 17 verses of John 13. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, but now he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, A person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that is why he said not every one was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and turned to, returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth. No servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. This is the gospel of the Lord. We'll continue singing of the hymn, Son of God, Eternal Savior.
excused for a kids' church? Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The Word of God we direct our attention to this morning as we preach through Romans chapter 12. We look this morning at verses 3 through 5. The Apostle Paul writes, For by the grace given me I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. This is the word of the Lord. Dear Christian friends, the book of Romans is filled with pure gospel milk, God's grace. And as you read through the book, that Paul penned to the church in Rome, there are two big words of the Bible you will find. Justification, that is, God sees me just as if I had never sinned, and sanctification, my response back to God, my life lived in service to God for the grace He's shown to me. And as you read through the entire book of Romans, you find a natural division that occurs. It occurs between chapter 11 and chapter 12. Because for the first 11 chapters, the Apostle Paul focuses on what God in Christ has done for the world. That big word, justification. That's the emphasis of the first 11 chapters. But now beginning in chapter 12, Paul shifts gears and focuses to our response to God for showing us His mercy and grace. And as he does so, beginning in chapter 12, he says, Therefore I urge you, dear brothers, as you talked about last week, in view of God's mercy, that is, see what God has done for you. He's extended to you His love and mercy in the form of Jesus Christ, the sacrifice for your sins. In view of God's mercy, now offer your bodies as living sacrifices. And so beginning in chapter 12, throughout the rest of the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul instructs the Christian in how to live in godly service. And this morning, as we focus our attention on these three verses, we remember serving in God's grace is a privilege given to us by God, but there's also a partnership we share. It's a privilege to serve in God's grace. If there's anyone who understood that more than us, it's the Apostle Paul. Because if you remember the very first time we meet him, in Acts chapter 7, the Apostle possesses a different name, Saul, and plays a different role in the church. He's a persecutor. Remember when Stephen was being stoned? We hear these words. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And Saul was there giving approval of his, that is, Stephen's death. Talk about an individual privilege to serve in God's grace. The Apostle Paul, once a great disperser and scatterer of the early Christian church, now privileged by God's grace to be a gatherer. Is it any wonder why he says, by the grace given me? By the grace given me? You see, the Apostle Paul was privileged to serve in God's grace because first he had been given the gift of faith and forgiveness. Faith in the one he opposed and forgiveness for all that he had done to show that opposition. Paul considered himself not worthy of receiving God's grace. And yet God poured out His mercy upon the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul considered himself the chief of sinners. And yet God considered Paul a 
an object of his love. Is it any wonder why? The apostle says, by the grace given me. He, re he reiterates this point as he writes to young Timothy, the pastor. He says, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength that he considered me faithful, appointed me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ. Not only does Paul make it evident that he understands the privilege of being called a member of God's family and privileged to serve in his family, he makes it known to others that that gift given him was purely that, a gift of God's grace, that he went from unbelief to belief, that he went from a persecutor to a gatherer of God's people. And the gifts that accompanied that were not his own. Paul doesn't say, because of my good looks, my outstanding job at being a persecutor, that God's given me all these gifts to serve in his church. He says, by the grace given me. He's reminded of that fact. And it's a fact that he wants you and me to remember this morning, too. It's a privilege to be a member of God's grace or to serve in God's grace, to be a member of his body. On Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday of this coming week, in Pinehurst, the community south of here, there are going to be thousands of individuals who gather for the U.S. Open. It's a privilege to be a member of Pinehurst, the community and the country club. But see, there's a fee that has to be paid to become a member. It's called a large amount of money. To be a member of God's church, dear Christians, there's a fee that has to be paid. It's called perfection. It's called being blameless. It's called being holy. It's called being without sin. And immediately, when we hear that word, be perfect, we begin to rationalize. No, God. I've got a different price. It's one that's not perfect. It's just a little lower. That's good enough. Because your price, that's not fair. I can't keep it. And so my mind begins to rationalize. Well, I've got this sin over here, and if I do so many good works, well, that'll even it out. No, God says be perfect. No sin. So my sinful nature latches on to this attitude. That somehow, some way, in some form, and in some way, I'm able to finagle my way into becoming a member of the body of Christ. How foolish. How foolish to think that I, by my doing, am privileged to be called a child of God. Because God says to me, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. No one's perfect. No one's kept that standard God set, perfection. The Apostle Paul says, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions and sins. It is by grace you have been saved. Becoming a member of God's body, the body of Christ, wasn't my own doing. It was purely by the grace of God. The privilege I deserved because of my sin was the privilege of eternal damnation. I didn't deserve to be called a child of God. Rather, I was the son of the serpent, the child of the devil. The privilege that accompanied that was not eternal life, but the fires of hell. God, who is rich in mercy and love, changed all that. He didn't want to give me the privilege that I rightfully deserved, but a better one. And he saw fit to change it. He gave that privilege of sin, death, or the, the privilege of, of hell and death because of my sin to Jesus Christ. And so Jesus Christ took upon himself that which wasn't his own, 
but that which was yours and mine, our sins. And he took them to the cross, and there he wiped clean our slate. So that now no longer is the privilege I deserve, death for my sin, but life because of Christ. He's given me proof. His death on the cross and the empty tomb that assure me that when my life here on this earth ends, because of the faith the Lord Jesus has given to me, my final resting place isn't the grave, but eternal life with him forever in heaven. By the grace given me, dear Christians, it's a privilege to be called a member of God's family. God went and paid the price for our sin. Jesus Christ. And what Jesus Christ has done in our place, He gives to each one of us. So that now no longer are we called sons of the serpent, children of the devil, but rather children of God. And so with the Apostle Paul, we can boldly acclaim, by the grace given me, because we're privileged to be members of God's family. And along with that privilege of being called a child of God, a member of the body of Christ, we have a beautiful partnership that we share. What does that partnership look like? Just as each one of us has one body with many members, and these members do not have all the same function, so in Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. The partnership that we share consists not of just myself, but another person. And it's important to remember, because stop and think about what happened when you were called to be a child of God. You were united with others in faith. You were united to the entire body of Christ. Not just the gathering here at Tree of Life, but you were united together with the members of the Wisconsin Synod, 400,000 plus. You were united to the Holy Christian Church on earth. You were united, or are united, with the saints and angels to whom we, with whom we join to sing, Holy, Holy, Holy. Holy is the Lord Almighty. Partnership we share isn't limited between husband and wife, child and parent, between two friends. It's not limited between the good days and the joys we share. No, the partnership we share, dear Christians, is the good and the bad, the highs and the lows, the joys and the sorrows, the rich and the poor. You see, we've been called to be partners together in the ministry all of us. With that partnership we share, <clears throat> the Apostle Paul gives us a beautiful picture of how that body works together by using the picture of a human body. I did a little research and I found out, if I'm correct, that our body has 209 bones, no, 206 bones, 469 muscles, 12 pairs of organs, and then the obvious, two hands, two feet, two eyes, a nose, and a whole bunch of other stuff. When you take the complexity of the human body and wonder how it all works together, take a step back, because it's a beautiful thing. A beautiful creation of God. That my hand works because the rest of my arm works that my heart pumps blood to the rest of my body so that my body receives oxygen through that blood. You see, all the parts of my body work together so that I can be one functioning individual. The same is true for you. Without one part of the body, the rest of it suffers. So too, we who gather together as one body, we're responsible to one another. It's that partnership that we share. I need you, and you need me. 
But why do I use my gifts in service for the body? Because it's you, dear Christians, the body, to whom God has given individuals who pray for one another during not only joys, but also during the sorrows. It's you, the body, to whom God has given spiritual individuals able to administer the affairs of this church. It's you, the body, to whom God has given capable individuals who teach the precious truths of God's word to your children. It's you, the body, who fellowships together, enjoying the faith that we share. It's you, the body, above all, that has the message of God's free grace and forgiveness that we've been entrusted with to share with one another. We need each other. Yes, there are a diversity of gifts among us this morning. And thank God, thank God for that diversity because it's necessary. We're not just one big eye. We're a body filled with many parts. When I recognize the partnership that I share and the privilege it is to be a member of God's family, I humbly serve. The Apostle Paul says, Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but think of yourself with sober judgment. I humbly recognize, dear Christians, I'm not like the person next to me because that person has been gifted differently than I've been gifted. And so I thank God for those gifts that he's given to that person. Because that person, no matter how big or how small that gift is, it fills a necessary part in the body of Christ. And so I look at the other gifts, not as my gift's up here and your gift is down there. No, equal in sin. We've been made equal in, in Christ. And we share the common goal and purpose of advancing God's kingdom as we work together as partners in the ministry that God has given to us. The Apostle Paul says, Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love, as each part does its work. I look at this glorious gathering of God's people, thank God for the gifts he's given to each one of you so that the body of Christ can function as the body which God has made it to be. There was a study done by the American Psychological Association by Jack Lipton, a psychologist at Union College, and R. Scott Bullion, an undergraduate student at Harvard University. They wanted to interview an 11 major symphony orchestra to see how each of the specific areas of the orchestra perceived the other areas. And these are the results. They said the percussionists were viewed as insensitive, unintelligent, and hard of hearing, yet fun-loving. String players were seen as arrogant, stuffy, and unathletic. The brass players were described as loud. Woodwind players were held in the highest esteem, described as quiet and meticulous, though a bit egotistical. With such widely divergent personalities and perceptions, how could an orchestra ever come together to make such wonderful music? The answer is simple. Regardless of how those musicians view each other, they subordinate their feelings and biases to the leadership of the conductor. Under his guidance, they play beautiful music similarity. There's a similarity between that 11 major symphony orchestra and we the members of the body of Christ. The similarity is this. Many different gifts given so that many different instruments can be played. All played together under the guidance and direction of that conductor to produce some beautiful sounding music. We, the members of the body of Christ, given a wide variety of gifts 
which we'll speak more about next week, all work together under him who is the head, Jesus Christ. And we do some really beautiful things. Carry out the work that he has given to us. To spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, the free grace and forgiveness that we are privileged to have and that we are privileged to share with one another. As you serve in God's grace, dear Christians, remember the privilege of being called a member of the body of Christ because it truly is a privilege. But also rejoice in the partnership that we share because God surrounded us with one another so that we can carry out the work he's given to us. God grant this for Jesus' sake. Please stand. Peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. I invite you to turn to page 6 in your service folder, and there we respond, giving thanks to God who's given us all our gifts. With the hymn we give thee but thine own.
to turn to page 42 in the front of Christian worship and we use the responsive prayer of the church that's printed there. Please stand. Lord God, our maker and preserver, we praise and thank you for all that you give us day after day. We are not worthy of all the mercies you show us. You have given us your precious word to nourish our souls and to protect us from the temptations of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature. We thank you for those who teach and preach your saving truth in this place and everywhere. Grant them a rich measure of patience, wisdom, and love. Heavenly Father, we pray that you shield us from every kind of danger, sudden catastrophe, terrors of crime, and the pain of disease. Watch over those who travel by land, sea, and air. Keep our loved ones from whatever perils may threaten them. Heal those who are sick, cheer those who are sad, calm those who are distressed, and comfort all who are old and infirm. Bless our land, our people, and those who hold offices of high trust. Keep our government and schools upright and strong for the advancement of good citizenship and useful vocations, that we may enjoy your gifts of peace, security, and well-being. Grant your blessings to every nation on earth, where there are wars, may there be peace, where there is hatred, let it be healed, where there is poverty, danger, or disaster, come with your almighty power to help and restore. Lord God, you created man and woman in your image, and it pleased you to unite them as one in holy matrimony. You have greatly honored marriage by making it a symbol of the spiritual union between Christ and his bride, the church. Grant that Mary Medke and Derek Moore, as they were united in marriage yesterday, may reflect this perfect love and commitment in their marriage all the days of their lives. Make their home your temple, and make their marriage a testimony to others so that your name is glorified among us. Dear Lord, we also ask you to be with our pastors and teachers and staff ministers as we meet in conference this coming week. Bless the travel of all that they may arrive safely. Bless the words that are shared that we may be encouraged in our lives of ministry towards you and that your people may be built up and encouraged and edified. Lord, bless the decisions that are made this, this conference and especially this coming summer as our synod meets in convention. May all the decisions that are made be, glory, be glorify your name and be a blessing to your church. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. We bring these requests before you in the name of Jesus, our Lord, and ask you to hear us. Take all that we have, our bodies and minds, our time and skills, our ministries and offerings, and use them to your glory. We give ourselves to you, that we may serve you in whatever way is pleasing in your sight. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace.
good morning. Certainly a pleasure to have you all here this morning. Look forward to enjoying some refreshment, some fellowship before you head out with the rest of your day's activities. Direct your attention to the insert to your service folder, the announcements for the week. You have the schedule for uh, the week in front of you. Uh, one note, after about uh, five or so minutes after we're dismissed, we'll ring the bell and invite all those who have uh, Sunday school age children, which would be the pre-kindergarten through the high school age, to uh, reconvene back in the worship area for about 10 minutes, 15 at the most. We'll try and keep it to that. At this time, I'll share with you the summer Sunday school program as well as uh, share the upcoming year program that uh, we do a different series of study during the summer and then uh, return to the Christ-like curriculum in August. So we'd like all those uh, who are planning to be part of our Sunday school program, uh, who have children in that age, to stick around after you grab a little bite to eat. Like I said, we'll ring the bell and then we'll share a bit of information. And uh, the kids as well, we'd like the children and their parents to be part of that. a few more uh, lengthy items in the inside that I'll, I know Vicar wants to speak to one of them. I'll let you read. Uh, coming up this uh, week, the, the ladies group, the WOW, has a guest speaker coming in that will be of interest to many, I'm sure, that um, will be Thursday night at 7 o'clock. Uh, the gifts in action, I just want to again kind of bring that to the forefront, that the team that's working to connect the ministry needs of our congregation with the spiritual gifts and passions of our members. Uh, they have begun to meet with the leadership team in determining the ministry needs of the different ministry areas. And in July and August, expect to hear uh, from them as they'll be taking opportunity with each of you as members to understand your gifts and where you'd like to fit into the body ministry in service to the Lord here at, at Tree of Life. Um, it's a, a great way to uh, see the body at work, as Victor reminded us very well grace that God has given us to be part of the body and the opportunity to serve together, uh, each part belonging to the other and each part necessary for the other. We have uh, our 3D exploration camp coming up in July, and uh, as I mentioned last week, a number of you weren't here, but we took undertook the family responsibility as uh, members to get the word out, and if you need more business cards. There are more on the back table. If you didn't, your household didn't get your pack of 20 business cards to hand out. There are additional packets and we've asked each household. And there's a card in there that gives you 10 or so ideas of how to get rid of those 20 cards uh, that we might uh, get the word out. Just to give you a, kind of a neat example of how that worked, we had one of our members uh, volunteer to put posters up around the, the community and a family that saw the poster in the Caribou Coffee uh, called and in the process of registering her child for the for the camp. So that's how the word gets out, and as we each take a little part, uh, the word will spread. So please, uh, please do that. Uh, maybe Conrad, if I can have you get that bin of, or those little bags of cards off the three-deck table underneath the mailboxes, and as uh, families leave who don't have one, if you could hand those out to them, that'd be great. Then another piece of the 3D uh, camp is the Project Timothy team of high schoolers that are coming to serve. And go ahead, Vicar. Since I have the responsibility to uh, make sure they get fed, I'm imparting that responsibility on each one of you to assist me in that. There's a sign-up sheet on my door, and I would ask that if you'd be willing to provide a meal. There are three options that I think we are going to work with. The first being an actual meal, the second being script um, that you buy from the church. Um, and we'd like to use that maybe more so for the evening meals because their time schedule in the afternoon is shorter um, to get a, you know, have somebody come over for a meal um, and then have them back here to church by 5.30. Uh, it puts a lot of weight on you also if it's easier to just purchase the script and, and then we, we'll take care of dispersing it so that their evening meals will be taken care of. If you do desire, though, to have them over for dinner, um, there are a Friday, a Saturday, another Friday night um, that we, you know, they're yours if you'd like them, uh, you know, for, for dinner. Um, please don't let that precaution prohibit you from engaging in service activity. Also, um, the lunch, the dinner, and then also we need snacks for the, for the kids, um, not only for the three-deck 
for the three deck participants, but also for the Project Timothy team. So if you'd be willing to contribute that, there's a sign up sheet on my door um, and would appreciate you gathering that. Also, um, if it's possible, we still do need housing for two to three of the females. It's a five female crew, uh, four teens and then a chaperone. If you're willing to house two or three women, um, let me know, please. That's all I have. If you have any questions, you can talk to me. Good. I know our president, Jack May, wants a word this morning. Yeah, just very quickly, I want to let everybody know that in July, the leadership team meeting, or the leadership team will be getting together and discussing the health of our, our building efforts and where we are today. We had a couple metrics set forth that we'll be evaluating at that time. I want to give everybody an update. Give him the feedback. <laughs> 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 uh, one is that we had a, if you remember the plan that Marty was working on, the 17,000 turned into 79,000 with the first and second quarter match. And I'm happy to say that we met both of those matches and the 17,000 will be turned into 79,000 for the second quarter, which is an outstanding thing. So thank you, everybody. And uh, say prayers. So thanks for that. <laughs> Uh, and secondly to that, we also had a, a metric that we wanted to be meeting our operating budget uh, by July. And I will say we're close, but we're not there yet. We're in the neighborhood of about $3,000 short on our operating budget. So say prayers for that as well. That, uh, keep that in your hearts as we move forward. But uh, we'll be getting together in July, and our hope is we'll be in a position where we feel comfortable with purchasing these So that's all I have to say about that. Thank you very much. Any other announcements to be made, Christy? Just real quick, I guess in action, just to follow up on that, Reese and Sigler and I will be doing interviews in July and August, but obviously to talk to all of you, it's a lot of work. So we would really like to enroll two people on our team that would help us do interviews. So if you feel like you have interviewing skills that can help assess what people enjoy with their passion, that can connect them with the needs, please talk to Trace or myself. Uh, we'd like to get you up to speed so that you can do the interviews in July and August as well. And the other thing is, there's excuse me, two new scripts out. There's a new Chick-fil-A over on Highway 55, so many of you may be frequenting that, then please don't do it without your script, because we now have Chick-fil-A and Starbucks in our slush. So if you need to get our see Linda or myself today. Great. Anything else? Just a reminder, grab a bite to eat those who have the Sunday school age uh, children and the Sunday school age children will meet back in uh, about five minutes. God bless your day.
are you? 